Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Manned Spacecraft Center. This is the Apollo 11 press conference. The format today will consist of a 45-minute presentation by the Apollo 11 crew, followed by question and answer. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Apollo 11 crew, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin. Neil? It was our pleasure to have participated in one great adventure. It's an adventure that took place not just in the month of July, but rather one that took place in the last decade. We all here and the people listening in today had the opportunity to share that adventure over its developing and unfolding in the past months and years. It's our privilege today to share with you some of the details of that final month of July that was certainly the highlight for the three of us of, of that decade. We're going to divert a little bit from the format of past press conferences and talk about the things that interested us most, in particular the, the uh, things that occurred on and about the moon. We will use a number of films and, and slides, which most of you have already seen, and with the intent of, of pointing out some of the things that we observed on the, the spot, which may not be obvious to, to those of you who are, who are uh, looking at them here from the surf surface of Earth. The, the flight, as you know, started promptly. And I think that was characteristic of, of all the events of the flight. The Saturn gave us one magnificent ride, both into Earth orbit and on a trajectory to the moon. Our, our memory of that actually differs little from the reports that you have all heard from the, from those previous Saturn V flights. And, and those, the, the previous flights served us well in preparation for this flight in, in the boost as well as the, the subsequent phases. I'll we would like to, to skip directly to uh, the translunar coast phase and uh, undocking, or the tr transposition and docking sequence. This was our first look at the magnificent machinery which had been behind us up until this point, the, uh, the booster. Of course, the first and the second stages have long since separated, but this shows the limb nestled inside the third stage, the S-4B, after the translunar inject burn. This maneuver was an interesting combination of manual and automated techniques in that we programmed the onboard computer to make the turnaround, and then these final maneuvers were made uh, completely manually. As I approached the, uh, the LAM, I had an easy time because I had a docking target, which is not too clearly visible here, which allowed me to align the probe and the drogue, which is the dark spot you see on the upper right. During this time, I also checked out the proper vehicle response to the, uh, my stick inputs. And here shortly, you'll see the actual docking somewhat speeded up. 
There's a point of contact. And in just a second, you'll see a second uh, right there, a, a second small indication of the uh, retract cycle when the 12 dot. For uh, the, the lunar module, of course, is uh, in a sense upside down relative to the uh, command module. This is in lunar orbit showing the uh, separation of the lunar module from the command module as, as viewed through my window. This was a busy time for me in that I was taking uh, these motion pictures through the right-hand window. At the same time, I was taking still photos through the left-hand window and uh, also flying my vehicle and... <laughs> probably poorly and uh, taking... Uh, a close look at the limb as, as he turned around. Uh, my most important job here was to make sure that all his landing gear were, were down and properly locked prior to his... De gives you uh, a better idea of the detail available with the 70 millimeter. Of course, this is a still and uh, shows the limb either right side up or upside down. I'm not sure which. Uh, it looks... Uh, more like, to me, it looks more like a praying mantis than it does a first-class flying machine in this view, but uh, it was a beautiful piece of machinery. The, the uh, landing gear are at the top, and uh, you can see the probes, which uh, indicate lunar contact as, as thin wires extending upward from the landing gear. Of course, before we could undock, as is shown in this uh, picture, we had to complete the activation. Now, the day before we undocked, uh, we entered the LEM and went through an entire switch configuration check, uh, and we exercised the various communication modes. Uh, in retrospect, since we did have a little bit of communication problems on the following day during power descent, we would uh, recommend that uh, we might make a more, more thorough check of this on the day before descent. Uh, on the day that uh, we did finally enter the LEM for the uh, landing maneuver, we uh, went through a staggered sequence of suiting, and we found that uh, with all the simulations that we had run back here in Houston, uh, or with Houston tied with our simulations in the Cape, that we were quite confident that we would be able to complete this uh, LEM activation in a given time period, which was approximately four hours. Uh, we managed to get uh, 30 minutes ahead of the time, and uh, it allowed us to get a more accurate uh, platform alignment check at one point. After the uh, undocking maneuver, we went through uh, a brief radar check, and then the command module uh, executed a two foot per second maneuver away from us so that we would both be able to independently uh, exercise our guidance system through a uh, star alignment check, which we did following this, uh, this separation maneuver. Now, this occurred in a vicinity close to the landing site, and you can see at this point, the command module is traveling right over the center of our targeted point. He's approaching now what we call the cat's paw. Following this uh, separation maneuver, on the backside of the moon, uh, we made a descent orbit insertion, which is a slightly over 70 foot per second maneuver that uh, lowers our altitude down to 50,000 feet. We had two guidance systems working for us, and they uh, behaved perfectly. Uh, both of them agreed extremely closely as to the results of this maneuver. Uh, following this, we used the radar to uh, confirm uh, the actual uh, departure rate from the command module. This is a view of the descent uh, trajectory area is viewed through the LEM window during our activation. In the bottom right of the uh, photograph is the crater Maskelin, and in the bottom center is the, the final phases of the descent. Uh, the landing area itself is in, uh, is in the smooth area at the top of the picture uh, just before we arrive at the shadow, or what's called the terminator. We had uh, seen a, a number of pictures from Apollos 8 and 10, which gave us an excellent understanding of the ground track over which we would pass during the descent. We're now looking out the right-hand window of the 
crater, and there's Maskelon W. Uh, it occurred approximately, approximately two to three seconds late and gave us, the, degraded our ability to determine not only our altitude and altitude rate in the final phases, but also, and probably more importantly, our translational velocities over the ground. It's uh, quite important not to stub your toe during the final phases of, of touchdown. And once uh, once settled on the surface, the, the dust cleared immediately. And we had an exploit, and of course the surface was very fine-grained. We could tell that from uh, from our view out the window, but there were a surprisingly large number of rocks of all sizes. This is the view out the right window. Up close to the horizon, you see uh, a boulder field that was probably uh, deposited by some of the uh, impacts in the craters that were behind us. You see, uh, most of the craters have rounded edges. However, there is a variation in the, uh, in the age of these, as we can tell by the sharpness of the edge of the crater. The immediate foreground area uh, we'll see more pictures of uh, later. It was relatively uh, flat terrain in contrast to uh, looking forward along where the shadow of the uh, limb uh, is cast on the surface and we see a, uh, a zero phase glow around the upper portion of the limb. The uh, general color of the terrain looking down sun was a very light tannish color. Uh, this blended as we look more across sun to a uh, uh, more sharper, well-defined features and more of a gray color. Uh, during the initial time period after touchdown, uh, we went through various uh, sequences to prepare us for immediate abort or liftoff if we found that that was necessary. We had found we had to uh, vent the fuel and oxidizer uh, manifolds a good bit earlier than, than we had thought. Uh, we went through these various checks and prepared for uh, uh, one liftoff that would occur about 21 minutes after the beginning of power descent. The ground gave us a stay during this period. We did not have to uh, make use of that. Uh, they, we then proceeded at that point into our uh, simulated countdown, which consisted of uh, checking our guidance systems uh, we made use of a gravity align feature where the uh, inertial platform of the uh, uh, primary guidance would, would use the gravity vector to determine the local vertical. We would then compare this with the alignments that we had previously. We also made use of the stars through the telescope uh, and aligning a uh, crosshair by rotating the, the field of view until the crosshair superimposed on the star. This would give us the uh, angular measurement of the star within the field of view of the telescope. We then determine the distance out by aligning another reticle spiral on this. We went through an averaging technique on board and then uh, fed this information into the computer and this came up with our various alignment checks. Uh, we, this was all in preparation for a uh, possible liftoff that would occur about two hours after touchdown as Mike and Columbia came over for the first revolution. The uh, ground network gave us a stay and uh, we continued briefly through the remainder of this checklist in our simulated countdown and at this point we uh, terminated and powered down many systems on board the spacecraft and uh, went into an, uh, an E period. A number of, of experts had prior to the flight predicted that a good bit of difficulty might be encountered by people attempting to work on this. This didn't prove to be the case and uh, after landing we felt very comfortable in the lunar gravity. Uh, it, it was in fact in, in our view preferable both to weightlessness and the Earth's gravity. This led us to 
believe, this in conjunction with the fact that all the systems in the limb were, were operating magnificently and we had very few problems, to uh, go ahead with the, with the surface work immediately. Uh, we predicted that we might be ready uh, to leave the land by 8 o'clock, but those of you who followed on the ground recognize we missed our estimate by a good deal. This was due to a number of factors. Uh, one, we had a house cleaning to perform, uh, food packages, flight plans, and uh, all the items that we'd used in the previous descent to be stowed out of the way and prior to depressurizing the, the lunar module. Uh, it took longer to depressurize the lunar module than we had anticipated, and it also took longer to get the cooling units in our backpacks uh, operating than, than we had expected. In sum and substance, it took us approximately an hour longer to get ready than, 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 we, would, than, than we had predicted. When uh, when we actually descended the, the ladder, it found it was found to be very much like the lunar gravity simulations we had performed here on Earth. And no difficulty was was encountered in in descending the ladder. The last step was about three and a half feet from the surface, uh, and uh, we're somewhat concerned that. Uh, we might have difficulty in, in re-entering the limb at the end of our activity period, so we practiced, uh, practiced that before doing uh, the exercise of bringing the camera down, which took the subsequent surface pictures. Here you see the camera being lowered on what might be called a Brooklyn clothesline. I, I was operating quite carefully here because immediately to my right and off the picture was a six foot deep crater and I uh, was somewhat concerned about uh, uh, losing my balance on the steep slopes. The, uh, the other uh, item of interest in the very early stages of the EVA should it, should it have been cut short for some unknown reason was uh, the, the job of bringing back a sample of the lunar rocks and these, these photographs show the collection of that initial sample into a small bag and uh, then that bag being deposited in my uh, pocket. This was the first of a number of times when we found, found two men were a great help. I quickly put up the TV camera. <laughs> Leisurely, but Buzz and I joined together to uh, erect the American flag. We found uh, on a number of occasions that we were help, able to help each other in many ways on the surface. Uh, you probably recall the times that I got my foot caught in the television cable and Buzz was able to help me extract it without, without falling down. We had uh, some difficulty at first uh, getting the uh, pole of the flag to remain into the surface. Uh, in penetrating the surface, we found that uh, most objects would uh, go down about five, maybe six inches, and then it would meet with a uh, gradual resistance. Uh, at the same time, there was not much of a supporting force on either side, so we had to lean the flag back slightly uh, in order for it to, uh, to maintain this position. So many people have done so much to give us this opportunity to place this American flag on the surface. To me, it was one of the prouder moments of my life to be able to stand there and quickly salute the flag.
the rest, the rest of the activity seemed to go very rushed. Uh, there were a lot of things to do, and uh, we had a hard time getting them finished. We did find that uh, mobility on the surface was, in general, uh, a good bit better than perhaps we uh, had anticipated it. There was a slight tendency to uh, uh, to be more nearly toward the rear of a neutral stable position. Uh, balance seemed to be quite easy to identify, and as one would lean one, uh, a slight bit to one side or the other, it was very easy to identify when this uh, loss of balance was approaching. In maneuvering around, as you saw, this was one of my tasks fairly early uh, in the EVA. I found that uh, a standard uh, loping technique of one foot in front of the other uh, worked out quite well, as, as we would have expected. One could also uh, jump in more of a kangaroo fashion, two feet at a time. Uh, this seemed to work. Uh, too many interesting things to do. The the surface, as as we said, uh, was fine grained with lots of rocks in it. It took footprints very well, and the footprints stayed in place. Uh, the uh, the limb was in in good shape and uh, it, it exhibited no damage from uh, the landing or the descent. It's a picture of the ladder with the uh, well known plaque uh, on the primary strut. The, uh, there was a question as to whether the limb would sink in up to its knees. It didn't, as you can see. Uh, the foot pad sunk in perhaps an inch or two. And uh, the probe uh, in this picture was folded over and sticks up through the sand in the bottom right hand uh, corner. Showing, uh, showing that we were indeed traveling slightly sideways at, at touchdown. Uh, there were a wide variety of surfaces. Here Buzz is standing in a small crater and it gives a very good picture of the, the rounded rims of the, uh, of the, what we believe are, are very old features. Uh, the uh, two experiments uh, that you saw in a previous picture uh, were deployed in the scientific equipment bay. Uh, we found that uh, getting them down uh, produced no significant problems. And uh, here you see uh, a view of my carrying these two experiments out to the deployment site about 70 feet to the uh, south of the lunar module. You have a very good view of the uh, varying depths of this uh, upper surface layer. You see that uh, along the crater rim, uh, a small crater rim off to my left, uh, along this the, uh, the upper surface appears to be about uh, two to three inches and the subsurface uh, uh, has a slope that is rather ill-defined and uh, one has to be very careful in, in threading your way around these very uh, small craters. Any long excursions I feel would would take a good bit of attention as you're uh, moving along to avoid uh, walking along uh, or down the slope of some of these smaller craters. This is the uh, passive uh, seismic uh, experiment that was deployed and has been giving us uh, good returns on the uh, uh, interactions of the, uh, of the moon. Uh, we had a uh, little difficulty deploying one of the panels. Uh, I had to move around to the far side and, and uh, release a restraining lever, and uh, then the second panel came out. We had a little bit of difficulty determining, as Neil said, uh, the exact uh, local horizontal. And I think this is due to the uh, decrease in the cues that a person has as to which way uh, up up really is. One has to lean a little bit more off to the side before you get this body cue that, that uh, you're approaching off, uh, off balance. And of course the, the terrain varied considerably uh, in this area. Uh, this second experiment is the uh, 
uh, laser reflector. We've uh, been successful in uh, bouncing laser beams off this. It consists of 100 uh, arrays of uh, corner reflectors. The uh, other experiment, uh, the core tube into the surface. We collected two different core tube samples. Uh, it was quite surprising the resistance that was met in this uh, subsurface uh, medium. And at the same time, you see that it did not support very well the, uh, the core tube as I was driving it into the surface. Uh, this is a close, uh, a double picture. It's actually a stereo picture. Uh, of, uh, of fine particulate material in, in the moon. This is uh, taken from a glass, and uh, the analysis of uh, the cause for that characteristic is of extreme interest to the scientific community. Second uh, picture taken with that uh, scientific camera shows uh, the nature of, of, uh, of the clods of, of lunar surface material. And this picture shows the 80-foot crater, which uh, I, that you observed earlier in the motion picture footage during the final phases of descent. Uh, we had very much hoped that uh, this this crater would be deep enough to uh, to show the the lunar bedrock. It, it was about 15 or 20 feet deep, and although there are rocks in the bottom, there are no evidences on the inner walls of, of actually uh, uh, getting a, a picture or a, a view of the, the lunar bedrock. We deposited uh, several items on the lunar surface. I'm sure you're aware of these. Uh, one was a disk with uh, 73 messages from nations of the world. There was a patch from Apollo 1 and uh, various uh, metals from the uh, cosmonauts. We also uh, elected as a crew to deposit uh, a symbol which was representative of our patch, that is the U.S. Eagle carrying the olive branch to the lunar surface, and we thought it was appropriate to uh, deposit this replica of the olive branch uh, before we left. This uh, after re-entering the, the limb, we could see the effects of her in the area where the majority of the walking took place. Uh, however, uh, in the left side of the picture where it is not uh, as dark, there was also a good bit of walking, and so that indicates that uh, the walking probably just uh, in, increases your ability to notice the effects of the strange uh, lighting that Buzz talked about earlier, where the cross sun lighting is a good bit darker than the down, down sun. Following the EVA, we had, the, uh, we had a sleep period which, in a word, uh, didn't go quite as well as we thought it might. Uh, we found it was quite difficult to, uh, to uh, keep warm when we uh, pulled rather difficult for us to sleep. You see, uh, mounted in the right-hand window, uh, the 16-millimeter camera, as it was mounted for uh, taking the pictures on the surface. Uh, following the sleep period, as we're approaching the liftoff point, uh, we progressed with a gradual power up of the lunar module, which included another star alignment up in front of the instrument panel that was used to record the uh, various messages that were sent up to us, the, the whole host of numbers for the particular maneuvers that were coming up that we would copy down. We'd log these on, on that sort of a uh, data sheet.
This film shows our final look at Tranquility Base uh, before our departure. And the ascent was a great pleasure. It was very smooth. Uh, we were very, very pleased to have that engine light up. <laughs> Uh, gave us a excellent view of the our our uh, takeoff trajectory and tranquility base as we left and at all times through the ascent we could pick up uh, landmarks that assured us that we were on the on the proper track there were uh, no difficulties with the particular out of plane maneuver that had been inserted between uh, uh, two other sequential maneuvers. In comparison with uh, many simulator runs, we found that this was uh, about as, as perfect a rendezvous as, as we could have asked for. You've noted some oscillations in this film during ascent, and that's a real characteristic. The, the vehicle, due to the changing center gravity as fuel is used, uh, does uh, a good bit of five degree oscillations throughout the ascent. This is Eagle as seen by Columbia, or perhaps half an Eagle would be better since uh, the uh, land. Uh, <laughs> although, uh, although we were far from home, we were uh, a lot closer to it than uh, than the pure distance might indicate. Uh, Neil's making the initial maneuvers here to get turned around, and then again I do the final docking. This is somewhat swifter than uh, than real time. The probe, the uh, the dark uh, funnel on the top of the limb, and the uh, the docking target below it and to the left in the, uh, the lighter portion of the limb. The uh, as Buzz said, the rendezvous was absolutely beautiful. They came up uh, from below absolutely uh, as if they were riding on rails. There was absolutely no uh, no disturbance. Uh, or any uh, off nominal effects during the last part of the rendezvous. Upper uh, right, you can see the uh, the RCS quads, and uh, down below the very at this relatively close range, it had a uh, decided three-dimensional uh, effect and was undoubtedly one of the most impressive sites. Uh, of the flight. As we, as we left the moon after uh, a successful TEI, this is the view that we observed. Uh, I think that, uh, at least from where, where I sit here on the stage, the colors uh, that you see there are quite close to being uh, actually representative of the moon as seen from, from that distance. We were uh, sorry to see the moon go, but we were certainly see, glad to see the Earth re return. Uh, we used, uh, uh, took a large number of, of photographs of the Earth on the way out and back, and uh, had our wristwatches set on Houston time. Uh, an interesting uh, use can be made of that. Uh, if you were looking at this picture and uh, and you looked at your watch and your watch said uh, 7 o'clock in the evening, then you'd know that uh, Houston is, is about 7 o'clock from the evening and it's about uh, an hour away from sunset. So uh, it would be about 1 24th of uh, an Earth circumference away from the, the shadow, which is just about 15 degrees there. So at any time, by looking at a wristwatch and looking down at the Earth, we knew what was underneath the clouds, and it aided us in some ways in picking out what uh, what we should be seeing. We could see a large number of uh, of de details on the on the Earth's surface. Uh, certainly, all the continents and islands and, and details. Uh, Many of which you followed, uh, perhaps, in, in our discussions over the over the radio communications. But it was interesting to us to find out how well we could uh, observe weather patterns on uh, not only the worldwide scale, which you see here, but uh, in the specific 
unique uh, localities. Uh, this particular shot does show the uh, coast of North America, uh, the equatorial uh, cloud layers, a what we think is probably uh, intertropical. We're ready now for question and answers and wait for the microphone and we'll go right down the line and we'll catch everyone if you'll just be patient. Tom will too. How much time did you have left in your uh, life support backpacks uh, at the time you got back on board LAM? Uh, I haven't seen the post-flight analysis of the numbers. Uh, we had rough, uh, roughly half of our available oxygen supply remaining in the backpacks and uh, somewhat less uh, percentage uh, in the water supplies, which is used for cooling. Uh, of course, uh, particularly on our first experience with the use of that backpack on the lunar surface, we were interesting, interested in conserving a good bit of margin in case we had difficulty with closing the hatch or repressurizing the limb or had any difficulties with getting uh, the uh, systems operating again in the normal fashion inside the cockpit. Uh, Colonel Aldrin and Mr. Armstrong, uh, when President Nixon made his phone call to you on the moon, it looked like you, the two of you suddenly stopped doing, doing everything and stood there and listened and talked to him. It looked there for a moment like you might have been a little bit aware of what was going on. You weren't busy. Was there ever a moment on the moon when either one of you were just a little bit spellbound by what was going on? About two and a half hours. <laughs> I'd like to ask Neil Armstrong when he began to think of what he would say when he put his foot down on the lunar surface and how long he pondered this, this st the statement about uh, a small step for man, gigantic leap for mankind. Yes, I did uh, think about it. Uh, it I, it was not extemporaneous, neither was it planned. It evolved during the conduct of the flight, and I decided what the words would be while we were on the lunar, lunar surface just prior to leaving the land. I'd like to ask Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, and I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, but when you first stepped on the moon, did it strike you as you were stepping, that you were stepping on uh, a piece of the earth or uh, uh, sort of what your inner feelings were uh, uh, whether you felt you were standing in a desert or this was really another world or how you felt at that point well there was no question in our minds where we were we've been orbiting around the moon for quite a while. <laughs> at, at the same time uh, uh, we have experienced uh, 16G before uh, we've been exposed to some degree to the, uh, the lighting that we saw. Uh, however, this was, in my case, uh, an extremely foreign situation with the uh, stark nature of the uh, light and dark conditions. And, of course, we uh, first set foot on the moon in, in the dark, shadowy area. How do you view space exploration as a relative priority compared with the pressing needs of the domestic society and the world community at large? Well, of course, we all recognize that the world is continually able to, uh, to neglect any of those areas, and we certainly don't feel that it's our place to neglect space exploration. But there was a lot of discussion. Uh, during the flight, uh, during the decent, our decent preparation. Now, uh, I don't think that uh, either the ground people uh, or ourselves really anticipated that this would happen. Uh, it was not a serious program alarm. It just told us that for a brief instant, the computer was reaching a point of, of being uh, over, 
uh, trying to solve these particular problems. We wanted to be able to look out the window to identify the features as they came up so that we would be able to pinpoint just where in the landing ellipse the, the computer was taking us. Buzz was carrying on a rapid-fire conversation with the computer at that point, but I think we really have to give the credit to the control center in this case. They were the people that really took What your feelings are, uh, is that perhaps the most difficult part of the mission, or are you looking forward to it? Well, certainly the, the part that we're least prepared to handle. Most <laughs> important piece of advice oh. or recommendation for the Apollo 12 crew. Uh, more and more dexterity with, with arms moving and fingers moving. Uh, these things are under study. Uh, of course, the Apollo 12 mission will have two different periods of, of EVA, one early in the mission and then sleep period, and then another EVA uh, following that. Uh, we've, in general, looked at, at their plans and uh, we've talked to them about the duration. We've talked to them about a, a brief period at the beginning of their EVA for their uh, familiarization with the, uh, the EVA, the 16G environment. Uh, I, I, I don't think we have any particular uh, recommendations for how, how they should change their mission. It, it is a continuing uh, involvement of uh, EVA capability and uh, scientific exploration that, that they're undertaking on that flight. Uh, you're now national heroes, and you've had a couple of weeks uh, in isolation in the LRL to think about that. Do you, what are your initial feelings about being heroes, how do you believe it will change your lives, and do you think that maybe you'll get another chance to go to the moon, or are you going to be too busy being heroes? <laughs> Long preparing is that we had to prepare for Apollo 11. Uh, in, a, in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, uh, we did have very little time for meditation, it turns out. Uh, we were quite busy throughout the time period with uh, the same sorts of things that uh, the crews of past flights have done after their flights. Uh, the debriefing schedules and writing the pilot reports and, and uh, getting all the facts down for, for, for uh, use of, uh, of all the people who will include that in future flights. I'm struck uh, from the movies and the still pictures by the difference in the very hostile appearance of the moon when you're orbiting over it or some distance from it and the uh, warmer colors and the relatively, apparently relatively more friendly appearance of it when you're on the surface. I'd like to ask Colonel Collins if he gets that same impression from the pictures and uh, the two of you who were on the moon, what impression you have along those lines? Well, the moon uh, changes character as the uh, angle of sunlight striking its surface changes. At uh, very low sun angles, close to the terminator, or dawn or at dusk, it has the, uh, the harsh uh, forbidding characteristics which uh, you see in a lot of the photographs. On the other hand, when uh, the sun is m more closely uh, overhead, the midday situation, uh, the moon is, uh, takes on more of a, of a brown color, uh, almost a, or becomes uh, almost a, a rosy looking place, uh, a fairly friendly place. So that from uh, from dawn through uh, midday through dusk, you, you run the, the, the whole gamut. of It starts off very forbidding, becomes friendly, and uh, then becomes forbidding again as the sun uh, disappears. Well, I think it requires some very pinpoint uh, determination of the orbit that the vehicle is in before it begins power descent. And this requires extreme care in, uh, this is the uh, this is what defines the, the error ellipse where we might possibly land having targeted for the center. Now, the ability to be able to uh, control uh, where you are requires that you be able to identify features. And of course, uh, in our particular of significant features as possible to give us as, as smooth a terrain. Now, in any area like this, there are always certain identifying features that you can come out, certain patterns or craters. And uh, to the extent that this can be used, uh, if the crew sees that they are not going exactly toward the pre-planned point, they can begin to... Uh, on a, and more on the landing, 
Did at any time you consider an abort while you were getting the alarms and so forth? Well, I uh, safely do so. And uh, as, soon as, as soon as program alarms, computer alarms manifest themselves, why you realize that you have a possible abort situation uh, uh, to contend with, but our, our procedure throughout the vehicle down in the same way that it, uh, it was programmed to do. The only thing that was missing during this time period is that we did not have some of the displays on the uh, computer keyboard, and we had to make several entries at this time in order to clear up uh, that area. But well, would see to your private lives in the years ahead. I, I wish I knew the answer. But I think the uh, the landings of the, the type uh, that are presently considered for the next number of flights are appropriate mm -hmm. to the conclusions that we reached as a result of, of uh, both our descent work and work on surface. <clears throat> that uh, we are able to investigate the, the variety of types of landing sites that they, they hope to, do, to accomplish. I have two brief questions I'd like to ask, if I may. When you were carrying out that incredible moonwalk, did you find that the surface was equally firm anywhere, or were there harder and softer spots that you could detect? And secondly, when you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? In, in rather flat regions, uh, the, the uh, footprint would penetrate perhaps a half an inch or sometimes only a quarter of an inch and gave a very firm response. In other regions near the edges of these craters, uh, we could find that the foot would, would sink down maybe two, three, possibly four inches. And in, in the slope, of course, the uh, various edges of the footprint would, might go on up to six or seven inches, and uh, compacting this material would, would tend to uh, produce a slight sideways motion as it was compacted on the material underneath it. So uh, we feel that uh, you, you cannot always tell just by looking at the terrain what the exact resistance will be as your foot sinks into a, a point of firm contact. So one must be quite cautious in, in moving around in this rough terrain. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla what, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. Neil, you were uh, a little bit concerned, you said, about stubbing your toe uh, at, at the point of landing because the surface was obscured by dust. Do you see any way around that kind of problem for future landings on the moon? Um, I, I think the uh, simulations that we have at the present time to uh, enable a, a pilot to understanding the, the problems of a lunar landing, that is, uh, a simulator and the various uh, uh, lunar landing training facilities uh, and, uh, and trainers that we have will do that job sufficiently well. Uh, above that, I think it's just a matter of uh, pilot experience. And, of course, uh, the a little bit of uh, uh, dispersions in the maneuvers such as the, the DLI burn on the back side of that ignition. And there is no way of compensating until you get to final phase for, for that error. Uh, based on your own experience in, uh, in space, do you or any of you feel that uh, there will ever be an opportunity for a woman to become an astronaut in our space program? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> I'd like to refer back to something that uh, Neil Armstrong said a while back, that there was so much out there you would like to have done. As it was, you ended up a considerable number of minutes behind the schedule. Is that because the schedule was overloaded for the EVA, or can we expect all astronauts, when they reach the moon for the first time, to enjoy themselves and, and spend as much time doing so as you seem to? Uh, we plead guilty to enjoying ourselves. Uh, I, as Buzz mentioned earlier, we're recommending that we we start uh, future EVAs with a 15 or 20 minute period to get these kinds of things out of the way. Get used to the uh, surface and what you see, adapt to the 1-6G and maneuvering around. And uh, probably we just included a little more in the early phase uh, than we were actually able to do. 
two questions. Where did the weird sounds, including the sirens and whistles, come from during the trans-Earth coast? So much more pronounced. Um, as for uh, Mr. Armstrong, uh, had you planned to take over semi-manual control, or was it all? Manual phase, uh, than, than we would have planned in order to find a suitable wet landing area. Uh, many of us and uh, many other people in many places have speculated on the meaning of this first landing on another body in space. Would each of you give us uh, your estimate of what is the meaning of this to all of us? Try that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I believe that uh, what this country set out to do was something that was going to be done sooner or later, whether we set a specific goal or not. I believe that. Uh, from the early space flights, we demonstrated a potential to carry out this type of a mission. And again, it was a question of time until this would be accomplished. I think the, the relative ease with which we were able to carry out our mission, which of course came after a very efficient and a logical sequence of flights, I think that just demonstrated that uh, we were certainly on the right track when we took this commitment to, to go to the moon. I think that uh, what this means is that many other problems perhaps can be solved in the same way by taking a commitment to solve them in a long time fashion. I think that we were timely in accepting this mission of going to the moon. It might be timely at this point to think in many other areas of other missions that could be accomplished. term aspects to it. On the near term, I think it's a, a, a technical triumph for this country to have uh, said what it was going to do a number of years ago, and then by golly do it, just like we said we were going to do it. Uh, not just perhaps purely technical, but also uh, a, a triumph for uh, the nation's uh, overall determination, will, economy, uh, attention to detail and a thousand and one other factors that went into it. That's short term. I think long term, we find for the first time that, that man has the, the flexibility or the option of uh, either walking this planet or some other planet, be it uh, the moon or Mars or I don't know where. And I'm poorly, poorly equipped to uh, evaluate uh, where that may lead us to. I just see it uh, as a beginning, uh, not just this flight, but in this program, which has really been a very short piece of human history, an instant in history, the entire program. It's uh, a beginning of a new age. Neil, how much descent fuel did you have left when you actually shut down? Um, my own instruments would have indicated uh, uh, less than 30 seconds, probably something like 15 or 20 seconds. I think the analysis of, uh, uh, made here on the ground indicates something more than that.
probably greater than 30 seconds, 40, 40 or 45. That was docking. Could you tell us precisely what was going on at that time? Were you docked and then... Uh, uh, oh, the, uh, are you referring to the lunar orbit docking when... Mr. Armstrong, uh, during the last few minutes there, uh, when, before the landing, when the uh, program... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Mayan Spacecraft Center. This is the Apollo 11 press conference. The format today will consist of a 45-minute presentation by the Apollo 11 crew, followed by question and answers. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Apollo 11 crew, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin. Neil? It was our pleasure to have participated in one great adventure. It's an adventure that took place not just in the month of July, but rather one that took place in the last decade. We all here and the people listening in today had the opportunity to share that adventure over its developing and unfolding in the past months and years. It's our privilege today to share with you some of the details of that final month of July that was certainly the highlight for the three of us of, of that 
decade. We're going to divert a little bit from the format of past press conferences and talk about the things that interested us most, in particular the, the uh, things that occurred on and about the moon. We will use a number of films and, and slides, which most of you have already seen. And with the intent of, of pointing out some of the things that we observed on the, the spot, which may not be obvious to, to those of you who are, who are uh, looking at them here from the surf surface of Earth. The, the flight, as you know, started promptly. And I think that was characteristic of, of all the events of the flight. The Saturn gave us one magnificent ride, both into Earth orbit and on a trajectory to the moon. Our, our memory of that actually differs little from the reports that you have all heard from the, from those previous Saturn V flights. And, and those, the, the previous flights served as well in preparation for this flight in, in the boost as well as the, the subsequent phases. I'll, we, we would like to, to skip directly to uh, the translunar coast phase and uh, remind uh, ourselves of, of the chain of events that long chain of events that actually permitted the landing starting with the undockings uh, the tra transposition and docking sequence This was our first look at the magnificent machinery which had been behind us up until this point, the, uh, the booster. Of course, the first and second stages have long since separated, but this shows the limb nestled inside the third stage, the S4B, after the translunar inject burn. This maneuver was an interesting combination of manual and automated techniques in that we programmed the onboard computer to make the turnaround and then these final maneuvers were made uh, completely manually. As I approached the, uh, the LEM, I had an easy time because I had a docking target, which is not too clearly visible here, which allowed me to align the probe and the drogue, which is the dark spot you see on the upper right. During this time, I also checked out the proper vehicle response to the, uh, my stick inputs. And here shortly, you'll see the actual docking somewhat speeded up. There's the point of contact. And in just a second, you'll see a second uh, right there, a, a second small indication of the uh, retract cycle when the 12 docking latch is made. We made uh, two entries into the lunar module. This is our first view of the inside of this. Uh, the final activation was made on the day of power descent. On the two previous days, when we entered, we removed, <clears throat> removed the probe and drogue and found that we had a rather long tunnel between the two vehicles. On uh, entering the uh, lunar module, one had to uh, do a slight flip maneuver or a half gainer to get into position for uh, the, the lunar module, of course, is uh, in a sense upside down relative to the uh, command module. This is in lunar orbit showing the uh, separation of the lunar module from the command module as, as viewed through my window. This was a busy time for me in that I was taking uh, these motion pictures through the right-hand window 
At the same time, I was taking still photos through the left-hand window and uh, also flying my vehicle and... <laughs> Probably poorly, and uh, taking uh, a close look at the limb as, as he turned around. Uh, my most important job here was to make sure that all his landing gear were, were down and properly locked prior to his descent and touchdown. This is uh, his yaw maneuver, and the, the white dots you see are the landing gear pads. This gives you uh, a better idea of the detail available with the 70 millimeter. Of course, this is a still and uh, shows the limb either right side up or upside down. I'm not sure which. Uh, it looks uh, more like, to me, it looks more like a praying mantis than it does a first class flying machine in this view, but uh, it was a beautiful piece of machinery. The, the uh, landing gear are at the top and uh, you can see the probes which uh, indicate lunar contact as, as thin wires extending upward from the landing gear. Of course, before we could undock, as is shown in this uh, picture, we had to complete the activation. Now, the day before we undocked, uh, we entered the LEM and went through an entire switch configuration check, uh, and we exercised the various communication modes. Uh, in retrospect, since we did have a little bit of communication problems on the following day during power descent, we would uh, recommend that uh, we might make a more, more thorough check of this on the day before descent. Uh, on the day that uh, we did finally enter the LEM for the uh, landing maneuver, we uh, went through a staggered sequence of suiting, and we found that uh, with all the simulations that we had run back here in Houston, uh, or with Houston tied with our simulations in the Cape, that we were quite confident that we would be able to complete this uh, LEM activation in a given time period, which was approximately four hours. Uh, we managed to get uh, 30 minutes ahead of the time, and uh, it allowed us to get a more accurate uh, platform alignment check at one point. After the... Uh, Undocking maneuver, we went through a, a brief radar check, and then the command module uh, executed a two foot per second maneuver away from us so that we would both be able to independently uh, exercise our guidance system through a uh, star alignment check, which we did following this, uh, this separation maneuver. Now, this occurred in a vicinity close to the landing site, and you can see at this point the command module is traveling right over the center of our targeted point. It's approaching now what we call the cat's paw. Following this uh, separation maneuver, on the back side of the moon, uh, we made a descent orbit insertion, which is a slightly over 70 foot per second maneuver that uh, lowers our altitude down to 50,000 feet. We had two guidance systems working for us. And they uh, behaved perfectly. Uh, both of them agreed extremely closely as to the results of this maneuver. Uh, following this, we used the radar to uh, confirm uh, the actual uh, departure rate from the command module. This is a view of the descent uh, trajectory area as viewed through the LAM window during our activation. In the bottom right of the uh, photograph is the crater Maskelon, and in the bottom center is the mountain called Boot Hill. Immediately above Boot Hill is a small sharp rimmed crater called Maskelon W, which was the crater that we used to determine our downrange and crossrange position error prior to. Uh, completing the final phases of the descent. Uh, the landing area itself is in, uh, is in the smooth area at the top of the picture uh, just before we arrive at the shadow, or what's called the terminator. We had uh, seen a, a number of pictures from Apollos 8 and 10, which gave us an excellent understanding of the ground track over which we would pass during the descent. We're now looking out the right-hand window of the crater, and there's Maskelon W. 
it occurred approximately, approximately two to three seconds late and gave us the clue that we would probably land uh, somewhat long. After, after completing those position checks, we rolled over face up so that the landing radar could uh, lock on the ground and confirm our actual altitude. Now, this picture doesn't show it, but at this phase in the trajectory, we were looking out directly at the planet Earth. In the final phases of uh, descent, after a number of program alarms, we looked at the landing area and found a very large crater just in the very left top corner of the picture. The, the camera is located in the right window and looks to the right and it just barely sees this boulder field we're passing over right now. We're at 400 feet and those boulders are about 10 feet across. This was the area which we decided we would not go into, extended the range downrange, and saw this crater, which we passed over this 80-foot crater in the final phases of descent and later took some pictures of. Now you can see the exhaust being uh, the, the exhaust dust being kicked up by the by the engine, and uh, this was uh, some concern in that it degraded our ability to determine not only our altitude and altitude rate in the final phases, but also, and probably more importantly, our translational velocities o over the ground. It's uh, quite important not to stub your toe during the final phases of, of touchdown. And once, uh, once settled on the surface, the, the dust cleared immediately, and we had an excellent view of the area surrounding the limb. This is the view out the left window. It shows uh, a cratered surface, uh, pockmarked with craters uh, up to 15, 20, 30 feet, and many smaller craters down to a diameter of one foot. And of course, the surface was very fine-grained. We could tell that from uh, from our view out the window. But there were a surprisingly large number of rocks of all sizes. This is the view out the right window. Up close to the horizon, you see uh, a boulder field that was probably uh, deposited by some of the uh, impacts in the craters that were behind us. You see, uh, most of the craters have rounded edges. However, there is a variation in the, uh, in the age of these, as we can tell by the sharpness of the edge of the crater. The immediate foreground area, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see more pictures of uh, flat terrain in contrast to uh, some of the more rolling terrain that we could see out the front window and uh, out the left window. 